So just to jump in this conversation, DW, when we, you and I were talking, you were saying how you used to edit songs off of YouTube and just like basically create new videos. I asked you if any of that work exists. Currently, you said no, yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> I really wanted to see it. Um, but what prompted that? Like, what, how did, I mean, I, I don't think anyone, anyone else in the room did that when you were like a teenager? I didn't, you know? Um, I was where a did big that come loser, from? loser, apparently. <laughs> Or ahead of your time. This um, is actually before YouTube. I would like be on Napster downloading music videos and uh, then be recutting them to different songs that I'd really love. So like seeing different directors like Francis Lawrence and really digging his stuff and then kind of pulling all of those elements and retelling different stories. It was really cool. And then would you say like looking back at that, are there elements of what you do now that came from that, kind of seeds from your work now in that earlier time? Oh, for sure. It really taught me how to pull apart a music video and to tell a visual story. Because I feel like in filmmaking, uh, you know, you're working with actors, you're working with dialogue. Through dialogue, you can tell a story of two people interacting or whatever the scene is. But through music videos, it's primarily through your visuals. So what does this shot mean? Why does this relate to this lyric in this song? And how do you move that story forward visually? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that that's... That's so interesting to me because when you're telling that story and I'm looking at your work, it really did raise that question. Like those, a lot of times what we're doing in our profession does have seeds of what we were doing as in our childhood and, and as teenagers. And I know Sean, um, interesting when we were talking, you had something similar where you, some of your first work, cause I was asking you like, where did your interest in music begin? And then where did your interest in film, assuming that it was at different points, but it's kind of the same, point where you were taking content off the internet and scoring it with your own music. Can you talk about what prompted that? What kind of visuals you were bringing forward when you did that? Yeah, um, early on uh, in my career, I found it very difficult to make a visual that matched um, the intensity of the audio I was working on. Um, I mean, financial reasons, obviously. But then on top of that, just um, like the know-how, you know, it, I feel like it takes experience and, and conversations with other people um, that are familiar with those kinds of things to kind of get that information and use it, you know, on your own work. So what I would do is I would, uh, I'd spend like all night on Vimeo or on YouTube, and I would try to find a visual that I thought matched, like similar to searching on Napster. I try to find an, a visual that matched the quality of the audio. I, I wanted to really prove to people that, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's an important call. It's very, he, he just dropped a new album. He's going on tour. Bowen has to stay on. Yeah, I'm my own manager, so I got to be on my, uh, my own shit. But, um, what was I saying? I was saying that I wanted to prove to people, you know, it's so important to me to prove to people that with this visual, um, the audio, or the, the vis like the audio was of a certain quality. Like when you're making it in your basement and everybody else is making music, it's difficult to be like, no, I'm really good at what I do. I'm slightly better than my contemporaries. It's kind of hard to prove that. And then also just to tell people like, you know, get them to kind of listen to the music. It's always, easier, especially back then, my, my thought was it's always easier to give them like a visual on top of that. So I would spend all night trying to find a video of a certain quality and I would, I'd call it a reversion or I'd just rescore it. So I'd rip it and I would credit the artist and the director every time in the bio, you know, like I wasn't just ripping it and stealing it and saying that I had made this thing, but I was just wanting to prove to people that, um, you know, my audio deserved that type of attention and quality on the visual side of things. And I think one of the most successful instances of that is like a, a video for the song called Firestorm and the video is this guy running through the forest on fire and the lyrics are very much about burning bridges and, and setting myself on fire and things like that that's too. That's what put me onto your shit. Right and, and that's what happens you know like people see that they see the audio and the visual they don't go oh this is some kid that made this song in his basement like forget it they they see the visual they see the audio and they see that the quality matches and then we can have a conversation and then from there more often than not they're just impressed that um the effort was even made to kind of do that you know and then again like when i met ruiz we started working on visuals and we ended up working on the 81 visual way later on but that i felt like kind of sparked that that moment i think that's 
so innovative too because a, a lot of times you feel like because everybody else is creating their own visual and maybe they don't have the team around them or the production quality so they're just going to do it and it's going to come out looking kind of mediocre but to right. to say i want all my visuals with my music to be at a certain level right. and until i can create my own visuals at the level of my music i'm going to kind of improvise with what's available right. and now that, that's again like i missed that but that was essentially the main point it was just like i respected the music so much I know how much time my friends and I were putting on it. I, I know I knew what it was valued at, and I didn't want to just go stand in front of the CN Tower and throw my hands around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I wanted I wanted to do something, and like you know, the worst thing that's gonna happen is somebody's gonna send you like a cease and desist, and that happened. Yeah. And you apologize and you're apologetic, but it's like yo, I I I love this shit. Like I need it to happen, and it's almost like flattery in a way. It's like. You know, at least yeah. that's how I sick twisted my mind is I try to like flip it in that way. No, I, I, and I think especially the fact that you're crediting it. Like I know a lot of people, if, if you're taking work and you're not crediting, that's a, a line you've crossed. Yeah. You're taking work, you're crediting, they might say, you know what, I don't want it used in that way, but it's a different thing altogether. Right. And I think like the, one of the questions that, you know, I, I have in my mind and I think to people that are not necessarily in the same practice as all of you is, is how is that transferable? Like how can you look at, I want to create work on a certain level, I don't have all the resources around me to do that. Part of what I'm doing is at the level, but part of it's not. Like how can I work with all, what already exists right. to kind of present myself at the level of my aspiration? Um, which is, you know, I think something as a takeaway. Um, Mauricio Madruk, I knew Madruk before I knew Madruk just because of the amount of artists that you've worked with, the amount of content um, that's been put out there and the level that has been put out there at. Um, but when we were talking, one of the interesting points for me was where your fascination with music videos came. Um, we have that corn video. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, so just so you know, for tonight, one of the things with this conversation, we're gonna spend some time listening to some things, we're gonna spend some time watching some things, so I'd never listened to a corn song <laughs> or watched a corn video, but it's amazing. Like, this is, yeah, yeah, that's why I was like, I, I was like, should I use a Madarok video or this? Because, like, and, and I think what's cool about this is, and we'll talk a little bit more, but this really made you wanna make music videos. That's 1998. Yeah, That's like, like such a powerful video. Um, how old were I you when you to, saw that? I wanted to make music videos. I yeah. wanted to be in a fucking band. I wanted <laughs> everything. I like, two of them look like they were Hispanic. I'm Colombian. The bass is crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yo, these guys are sick. Like, I was 14 years old when 14? I came in 1998, right? So, what's that? System of a Down. Yeah. Just, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you know that. You look like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crazy. And how old are you? Well, well that's fire. So you were Good like research. three when this was coming out, which is amazing. That's dope. That's dope. So, uh, so you're that's saying really cool. like you wanted to be in a band off of that? You wanted to make music videos yeah, off that? My my question to you is. What elements of what was sparked in your imagination at that age, seeing that video, well, is, is a part of your work with Mad Ruck? That's a good question. Well, I mean, when it came to that video, there were so many different elements that I love. Like, I used to draw when I was younger as well, too. So there's the animation element. And all that's done by Todd McFarlane. Todd McFarlane from Spawn. Okay. Well, so oh, wow, wow. He, he did all that. And then this is like, this is pre-Matrix, too. So all those elements that are happening in the video are like, prior to the Matrix coming out. So there's a lot of shit going on in this video. Today is like very much like, oh, it, might, it still actually looks really fucking good, to be honest. It does, but, it does. But, um, but a lot of it was before Hollywood was doing it. And uh, I don't know, it was just the energy. Um, and I remember just watching that and being like, yeah, I want to do this with the rest of my life. This looks like it's fucking cool as shit. And I happened to be in a, in a communications technology class in high school where we learned how to edit and we learned and we picked up video cameras and our teacher was really dope and he was just, you know, he'd show us how to work on this stuff and 
there's a story element to that as well too because that song is about the industry funny enough it's about um how the industry is just always blood sucking and always like just taking a piece of you it's so. interesting because for me I, I thought of a couple of things of like it could be many things too yeah a lot which of is like the prison industrial complex and like the totally. the wisdom of the child and the corruption of the state like there's so many narratives that are in there and like the moment where the child is swinging I feel like that's the that's part that moment. got me the most yeah. like it almost hits a lot of people it goes first it's going through items but there's that moment which I feel like is really intentionally crafted where yeah it's yeah like, absolutely you know yeah I just remember seeing that and um I've always as and then as I got older you know you said something about access about making music videos and not having and we I didn't we didn't have access to anything either like we was out there shooting with a DVX camera, you know, and it was like we scraped together four hundred dollars to like make a music video. But then a couple of people noticed, oh, you got a good eye, and so then you just start to learn with other people who are also trying to build their craft. So, Aaron A, who is doing amazing work till this day, he was like one of my mentors. Really? Yeah. How, how did that relationship come about? He was doing fucking hood videos from mayhem moriarty like well, mayhem moriarty this is before Shout out mayhem. Soze. this is yeah yeah and soze like, like yeah. and like jb and jelly Star, like every all yeah, these guys wow, wow. and i was like oh shit this is kind of crazy yeah um and what's that yeah so then shout out to jellystone yeah. for real and then we we connected on that and at that point he started transitioning to doing work for nelly Furtado. like so he went from like like Frankie Payne juggernaut to Nelly Furtado. Which is interesting because it's probably the similar thing, right? And bigger right? budgets, really, at the end of the day. So, But he saw you had an eye, and I'm sure someone else yeah, saw he, he had an eye. Yeah, he took exactly. Well, so yeah. who saw, like, it was Chris Smith who was managing Jellystone at the time, mm -hmm. but also managing Nelly Furtado. Okay. Took him under his wing. And still to this day, they, they work together. Wow. Um, he can always trust their You can always trust their And, like, they've just built this really great relationship, which is, like, a very important part of this business as well. Um, but for Mad Ruck, I think it just kind of came down to us being like, I like the music videos that were coming out of Toronto, Canada, but no bullshit. I thought we could do way better. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just being younger and just being like, fuck this. I want to just. But, I mean, how does it, it? How does a city and a scene grow without the next generation feeling like? Yeah. I love what I'm seeing, but I want to take yeah, it to the absolutely. next level. Yeah, right? absolutely. And it's it's just it's it was never like negative competition or anything. It was always healthy. And even now, there's like. You know, these other there's a younger generation of directors, producers who are incredible and are probably looking as well at Mad Rock and be like, nah, shit on these guys. Which is fine. Like it's all it's all they, love. They might be in this room. Absolutely. <laughs> and they should be in this room. <laughs> um, I wanted to jump into a question to all of you, which is kind of the premise of this conversation. Is my assumption that I'm bringing forward is that there is more of a relationship between filmmakers and music than there has been at different times, that there's more use of narrative in music videos, um, that there's more use of cinematic visuals in music videos, and, and that musical artists are looking at film as another option for how they not just can communicate but have to communicate and we've gone through a bunch of reasons in our previous conversations like is it the access to equipment is the pressure of social media is it the need to provide content to audiences is is it how audiences are viewing artists as brands and, and always wanting something really like beautiful um one to each of you like do you what do you feel about that do you think that there is more of a relationship right now between filmmakers and artists in terms of music musicians and musical artists um, and what do you think some of the factors are behind that you do you want to jump in I'm going first apparently yeah. um, I mean I'm an artist myself so when it came to directing my debut music video I felt like it was gonna be quicker for me to take my skills that I had learned as a director and implement them because I'm getting through that kind of information and the brand that I know true in my heart faster uh, I've worked with bands who you know don't really know a lot about the film industry but they know they want a dope music video and then that's like the starting conversation. And for me, it's about figuring out what do they want to say? What is the song saying? Who are they? What is their kind of brand? And getting to know them, I think that um, it's really important to get to know the artist so you can kind of yeah. represent their voice authentically uh, and then really digging and kind of pushing the visuals. Because at the end of the day, you can have a great song, 
But if you have a great music video with that great song, like it's it's boundless. You can go anywhere with that. Whereas if you have a great song and the music video is okay, like it's not, you know, as much as a hit. Yeah, it doesn't elevate the work where the possibility of adding a visual can elevate it. Mauricio, you no, know. I was just gonna say to that point too. I think also it's the other way around as well too. Is like a great music video can't make a bad song good. Like, so if you have a bad song, you're going to have a bad music video no matter what. Um, that's my personal well, belief. Well, unless, as I was saying to you, unless you, like, watch it on mute, then <laughs> it could be a great visual. Yeah, we do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we definitely do that sometimes. I don't, did anyone, did you guys used to, like, play music and then just have a TV on and, and watch and see if, like, it looked like that commercial was a video for the music? No? No, but maybe you did. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly I did. <laughs> I definitely did that, and yeah. I still do that. It, was, it would sync up sometimes, too. Like it would oh, look, it's, a, yeah. it's amazing. My thing was cartoons. If yeah. you put on like a Disney movie or whatever, and you put on some crazy, awesome music, that and also Olympics figure skating. You, it <laughs> gets so much better if you put on your own music and you just mute that. It's crazy. Yo, that's like an Olympics hack for anyone who's not sure about figure skating in the Winter Olympics. This, this is how you do score. it. I figured it out. Sean, I know you were when we, you and I were talking. You were saying you don't really know if that's the case. Like, if there is more of a relationship between filmmaking and, and artists, or whether music and filmmaking has always kind of had that relationship since black and white. Yeah, I think. And again, I'm young, ish, so I I don't know, but I feel like. Uh, I feel like it was at its height in the MTV era, right? I feel like that's when people started really investing larger budgets and, and spending more time crafting these videos. And I think since then, since that era, uh, we're way past that era. Um, I think now a lot of music videos are being made because people run out of ideas. I think a lot of people are just making videos. Uh, I noticed the trends too. So like I noticed, um, you know, I noticed when Kendrick went on that run, that crazy run, I think it was a year, two years ago or whatever, and he was making a lot of videos. Like, it was right, just with Damn, that was after that masterpiece. That was any yeah. any any director I spoke to about working on a visual steered the conversation in that way, you know, or like uh, I'm trying to think who else went on a crazy run with some videos, like you know, even Kanye when Kanye had it, um, and when I was in high school and things like that. It's like the bar, somebody raises the bar, and then everybody's kind of chasing that bar. But I, I'm not. I'm not convinced that things are different now. I think the technology, I think the fact that like in our pockets, probably 95% of us in this room have technology more powerful than people had in their homes or in like laboratories 20 years ago. You know what I mean? So I feel like it's it's mostly that. Um, I can't bless you to ever sneezing. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I don't give, I. I don't give, I can't give my like generation or this era extra credit for that. You know, I, I just feel like it's we're fortunate. These are the times, and again, five years from now, they're gonna have even better technology to to play with and things like that. You know. Yeah, and in in thinking about it, for me, it does feel like there's a lot of factors coming together on that. One of those I put to all of you was album artwork. You know, and whether the fact that you as a music fan, rarely get to hold the sleeve of an album and go through it, whether the need to connect with that project and that artist is, is now kind of fulfilled by the video and there's just more of a demand of something at an elevated quality, right? Where it's like just doing your song in front of like an interesting background for three minutes is not enough and, and whether there's a relationship with the, the lack of having the artwork in your hands. Um. I think, it, I, and like even with that, like just the more time I spend in this game, like I realize there really are no wrong answers. Like there are people with really bad videos and bad songs that depending on how you judge success are, are extremely successful. That's and true. then you can go on YouTube and see a video that is breathtaking. You know what I mean? Like so good that you don't even want to share it with anybody. Like, <laughs> and it has like a thousand, two thousand, maybe 10,000 views. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I. I, it's really like more of a, it's, it's almost everything else around it that's kind of dictating, you know, what we perceive. And then again, just opinion, you know, like what's good, what's bad. You know, like my, my opinion is like 
very different than a lot of my peers. Yeah, you like know. Ta taste wise. Yeah. But I guess the, the, for tell me, the, you're gonna jump in. No, I said tell them. <laughs> well, well, I think like the the question I guess boils down to: Can an artist in 2018, 2019 get away with putting out a visual that does not have a cinematic quality to it, um, and some kind of and or some kind of narrative? And obviously, there's always going to be exceptions. Like, there's that one person that can do something kind of completely out of what everyone's doing. But is there room for Absolutely. artists to do that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. More than ever. How so? It's just my opinion that yeah. a bad song is a bad video. Like, that's just my opinion. But I, there's a lot of bad music out Well, I don't even want to say bad music, but it's just like the visuals aren't what they were. This is a million dollar budget, the corn freak on a leash video. You know what I mean? You can't compete with that. It, the, the game is changing now with the record business in like, after I think 18 or 19 years is actually making money again, right? But they cut budgets down from like a million dollars to like 30,000, you know? And if you're a starting artist, you have nothing. You have zero. Yeah. You have absolutely zero. So, you know, but there's like, I don't know, it's, uh, it's the world of social media now as well too, right? So there's just like, even sometimes... It's just whatever connects with the audience. Like, the music video for, for Kiki is not what connected up personally. It's the dance. It's right. the viral of the video, like, of, of what Shiggy did. Yeah, and, and, and there's, I think no, there's it, no narrative and, like, there. It's just something that everybody related to. It's like, well, well, fuck with there's this. A, I mean, in that video, you know, you have the skit. You have different film. Like, they're using film camera, digital, cutting between things. But uh, to your point. The video's point, great. But, but, but to your point, I do think that, like, literally, if they just had something where it was multiple people doing that dance like and just cutting between different cities and different people doing it on like a basic like on a phone camera the video probably would have got as many views right or it would have it would have been popular. Yeah, it would have it would have been just as successful yeah because of who's doing it yeah, yeah. and audiences are much more forgiving uh for established artists and much more um difficult on those coming up well which circles back to like why you were doing what you were doing um and, or why like a lot of emerging artists that work with Mad Ruck um, benefit so much from the experience you have and, and the level you can deliver the visuals at. Um, I wanted to switch the conversation up a little bit to your project. Um, that's my DJ. We're gonna show a clip from that and then talk a little bit about it. And this is a clip. It's pretty that sexy. I'm just letting you guys know. I gave you this sexy clip. <laughs> and and to the point of looking at a series that's really musically driven and a scene that's truly like driven by a song. So if you, if you can just give us first a little bit of background about the series and I think within the frame where you had said to me, you were DJing, you were looking mm -hmm. at the nightlife in the city and seeing like, this is a TV show, why isn't anyone writing this? And you're like, oh, I should write it. Yeah. Um, if you can just start from there in terms of that revelation and a little bit about this series and the clip. Totally. Uh, so, as you kind of mentioned, when I first started DJing and DJing around the city, uh, you know, DJing random bars, 16-year-old birthday parties, you really get this weird perspective on parties, uh, and I thought it was very interesting. Lots of drama, you know, when we all drink at 2 a.m., shit goes down in the club. Uh, so I was like, this is so great. Why aren't people talking about this? Why aren't people kind of sh doing a CW show based in this world? It's so colorful, and there's so much music, and it's so vibrant. And then I kind of had my my aha moment, oh wait, it's, it's me. So then I started to kind of write the things that were happening around me, the friends that I was making, and all of the different experiences of being a DJ in a city full of DJs, in a world full of DJs, and how that means something and how it means nothing at the same time. Well, like to break that down a little bit though, because I think that a lot of people observe things and sometimes ask that question, why isn't this you know, out there? Or how come no one's doing this? You're observing it. And you said you started writing down the stories. Like, what format were you writing that in? How long was it? Like, was it little notes? How and how quickly did you move to like creating episodes? So for season one, it kind of came together quite quickly, and then I kind of jumped right to doing Indiegogo. 
I felt kind of as a woman and not really seeing myself represented in the director's seat, I already felt like I was up against the odds. So I was like, I'm just going to self-finance myself because I don't believe that anybody will believe me. Uh, raised $15,000 and hired my producers and hired my cast and, and did that whole process and made a little family and did the first season, did all the social media, did all the branding, did the editing, like just kicked the crap out of that first season. And it made a good dent in the city. Thank you. So I wanted to, when you said made a little family, can you break down what that means a little bit more? I think when it comes to collaborators, it's so important because you guys, we all have kind of like collaborators we work with. It's so important to trust your gut and watch other people's work and look at their work ethic. A lot of people are in this game to say, I'm hanging out with the cool kids or I'm, I'm on the set of that music video and look at me on Instagram. But there's a a few people who are actually willing to do the hard work to stay up to 2 a.m., to read the goddamn contract, which is so fucking important, uh, and, and to hustle. So I think it's really important to trust your gut and surround yourself with people who want to go the distance and who believe in the projects. If they don't believe in it, then, you know, they're not your allies. Yeah, and if anyone's taking notes, read the contracts, yeah. <laughs> no matter what you're doing. Um, the, the other thing that you mentioned was you edited it. And I think that's an interesting part of your story as well because um, you, you had made the comment that you were pursuing a career as an editor and then you know ended up being like supervising the editing process because you didn't see room for women directors in the industry. Um, what is it, I guess, what was the value of putting so much time in the editing side to you being a director? And what was the kind of tipping point where you're like, no, I, I can edit, but I'm a director. For me, I, they're just, it didn't even dawn on me that I could be a director because I just didn't, that was a male's role. That's just what I had been taught. That's what I knew. So I was like, okay, what's the closest I can get to storytelling? And so I fell in love with editing, putting together a story, watching rushes, watching actors kind of do what they do and finding those special moments and piecing it together. So that's how I got into assistant editing and then editing and then eventually moved into post-supervising because... If post is not organized, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a project that never gets made. Exactly. I was watching. I was just on Facebook, and that, that guy um, Herzog, I think his name is. He does um, documentaries, and he was like saying how some emerging filmmakers will come to him and say, "I have like 460 hours of amazing footage," and he's like, "My heart breaks for that oh person." God. He's like, "Oh God." You know, like you, you have to have a plan. The yeah, best yeah. directors have a plan. That's, yeah. <laughs> which, which I wanted to put to each of you because I think that one of the things that happens a lot is like you think about a director and you have these models in your mind of the people who get the awards and you constantly see like in you know media magazines and all that um, and, and might, you might have those skills of a director but not necessarily recognize what th that you have that. Like what would you each say is the essence of the role of a director? What is the essence of what makes a great director? I think what makes a great director is somebody who listens to everybody on set, whether that be your actor or your grip, and knows how to communicate. I think communication is so important. You're dealing with every single person on set. And at the end, end of the day, you need to drive a car down a lane, and it needs to be a concise vision and a concise story. And if you don't know how to communicate with your camera department or your actors or your editors, you're not going to be able to get to the end of that road. So I think ultimately treating people with respect and listening and getting the best out of everybody is how you're going to get that best product. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> it's dead on. Copy, paste. Sean. Yeah, uh, everything she said, I, uh, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and just being just being decisive, you know, uh, yeah. indecision on the set. Like, indecision can happen, I think, leading up to shoot day, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, we brainstorm, we springboard, you know, we funnel ideas, that's, that's totally fine. That's part of the process. But on that shoot day, you know, it's like you're waking up, whoever you are, if you're directing this thing, you're directing this thing. And it's almost like you know, putting on this hat and then just being that person until, you know, you're wrapped for that day, you know? But obviously respecting everybody on set, you know, being like listening to people is, is super important. But, you know, uh, leading up to that, I think the day of everybody should already know kind of what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be kind of um, showing people or like, you know, or like kind of 
taking time to explain to them what you require from them on this day. Or saying, you, I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know on set as a director. You're the leader. If you don't know, nobody knows. That's so what yeah. the hell is yeah. everybody going to do? Stand right. around and look at each other? <laughs> yeah. like, and that happens. And then you break for lunch and everybody's at lunch. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So, I mean, I guess what I'm hearing in, in you know, is like it's about set, being able to set an atmosphere. It's being able to ensure that every single person understands their role and the vision. And then it's taking the responsibility of the decision. Yeah. Like other people be like, oh, well, you know, he said to do this, he said light it like this. Okay, I don't know how it's going to look, but he said like, or she said that, you know, but being willing to take that on and say, I'm going to make that decision. And to, to get to that, like, pre-production is a big part of it. Mm, yeah. Just like Sean was mentioning, like, to come to those decisions, pre-pro's big. And depending on how big or small, you want to make sure that everybody's prepared before they get to set. What do you like to see from a director that you're working with in the pre-production that puts you at ease? I, we do music videos, and we still do pre-pro booklets. Like, I want to see what the cast looks like. I want to see locations. There better be tech scouts. There be location scouts. Obviously, having your keys, your art director, editor, cinematographer, you know, you want to make sure all your departments are developed. And it, to, to the smallest details of, like, where are we going to get lunch? Like, you want to make sure you have all that prepared because it just makes the day a lot smoother. Who's your assistant director? You know, you know what kind of a set you're going to be on depending on which assistant director you're going to have because it's all personalities at the end of the day, right? Um, everything. Like, wardrobe. I can't believe I'm not yeah, talking yeah. about wardrobe. But <laughs> like, wardrobe for... For film artists, works. yeah, film, whatever yeah. it may be, it's massive. So, all details. Amazing. And a pre-pro booklet, which like I can send you a sample, and you could send out to these I'll guys. Take I'll yeah, take sure. a sample. Yeah, sure. Yeah, me of too. Course. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that so everybody knows. Yeah, like, so if I'm, you start I'm, filling that in, it's like 14, 15 pages, right? So I'll give you an example of a pre-pro okay. booklet, and then you guys can use that to your advantage. Yeah. So at Water Vision is my handle. Thanks, Ruiz. Message me your email address. And I'll get you the booklet. Um, and I appreciate you offering that because I think that one of the things that these conversations are really about is it's it's personal and professional things you can take away and apply. Like it's the hope is that when we assemble here, that you walk out of this space with something you can do differently and see differently on the personal professional side. So that's super practical, and I'm curious to see what it looks like as well. Sure. Um, we're gonna get to watch something from Sean. Um, the piece that we're going to look at is Life When You're the Movie. And it's really, for me, it's, it's a powerful moment of looking at what it is to be an artist and to be a parent um, and fatherhood. So let's watch it. Seen that. I haven't seen that in a while. And like my daughter just started school, wow. like two two and a half weeks ago. Her mom's here. Shout out to her mama. Um, and it's it's just trippy watching like actually yeah, seeing. How does her that so how does that feel? Because I know you were telling me that like you know you were brought to tears dropping her off at school on your first day. <laughs> yeah, expose um, me. Um, <laughs> yeah, like well, I okay, mean, but before I just be I drop my daughter with my son every day. Yeah. But today was the first day I dropped her by herself. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't leave. Yeah. You know, I was just like standing there. Like, yeah. And I was actually thinking about what you said. So yeah. I'll call you out. I will no, also I'm even tripping. Myself. Like I'm not not at all tripping at all. Like that's that's totally fine. Um well like 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 you said, that what that was called Life When You're in the movie. Um and the way my team was working was like, in order to get that equipment, usually we had to be shooting somebody else's video. And then we just double back on the equipment before we got to return it. <laughs> so, um, and that's just super cost know. effective. Um, and like, again, like I couldn't, I didn't have the budget to go fly somewhere and shoot this. You know, I had to make, you know, the people in my life, I had to make my surroundings. I had to capture that in a beautiful way. I mean, I was scoring my life anyway, so it made sense to um, include these people, and, and that was where we were living. And actually, we ended up converting that space into a museum uh, back in January, and we ran it for a few months. Um, thank you, but um, that was, that was like the, the sink where I would give my daughter a bath, or her, her mother would give her a bath, and, and, and you know, 
early on, and I mean, I'm still learning, you know, fatherhood, you never stop learning, but early on, I was like, just so thirsty for knowledge and, and research and perspective and opinion on what it was to be a father. And I was wrestling with this um, pain that I was like, I don't know if I'll ever, cause I, I love, like I love her. So I was like, I don't know if I'm ever even going to want to do this anymore. You know, it's like, it's tough to be away from her. And you know, I saw that Ted talk and he was basically saying, you know, in more ways than one, like, you know, if I don't chase my dream, how can I, expect my daughter to or how can I when she asks me when I'm older like what was your dream like what am I going to say to her you know I want to materialize this this thing I want to make it a tangible thing and I want to show her when she's older she'll be embarrassed right but I want her to see how much she meant to me and how much she changed me just as an artist um and that whole film is basically just going through um those motions and like you know the conflict and the crisis like afterward you know, there's a shot, I'm with my homies, and then there's like the crisis, and there's just this conflict between like who I used to be and who I wanna be now for my daughter. So if you have some time, please check that out. It's called Life When You're the Movie. Yeah, um, it's really it's really beautiful. Um, and I think like there's lots of things that were sparking me. You know, the, that little moment where um, the TED Talk says, you know, the sins of the parents visit the children, right. you know, and that sin of like having a dream that you let die and then you know, not being the example of like manifesting that dream. Right. Yeah. Um, and, there, you know, I was actually um, Junior to use, you know, amazing producer in the yeah, city. Shout out to Junes one time. Yeah, he shares a similar story of like wanting to, as a parent, saying that conflict. Like, I want to be present in my daughter's life, but I also have to look at it and say, me doing this music and really like knowing that this is my purpose and this is my dream is such a powerful example to her, too. Um, one other question I wanted to ask about that particular scene because you're using like there's some docu style footage in right. that there's a ted talk that that wasn't you i'm um, doing the ted talk right. Right. <laughs> and then there's you know some other footage of you know use ajax right um, um, no actually that's a park in parkdale and okay. literally that audio was a different was a different moment but it was her mother pushing her on the swing ah, okay. um and that whole scene is me like pushing my daughter on the swing and that's kind of what that signified and that's like a park that she kind of grew up on in parkdale like you know we couldn't walk past that park without her wanting to play yeah, in it yeah. you know it was like i used to take longer ways around sometimes so i could avoid <laughs> having to you Eventually know go to that she park realized you're like <laughs> yeah. the, the cab yeah. driver that's taking the long <laughs> right like, yeah the uber really driver all the way this way yeah. um but i guess my question on on that was some linked into something you said to me earlier as well which was about you know having a vision in your mind of what you want this to look like with the song yeah. what we saw there how close is that to what you visualize in your mind um that's uh i mean when i had first made that record you know some people were like disrespecting my the mother of my child and I got super angry and I got super defensive and that's essentially what charged that record. So I didn't have a visual in mind um, for it. And then I saw the footage and I said, this works. Similar to the same type of um, energy I got when I was just reversing videos when I was coming up. It was like, I saw this scene and I said, no, nah, this is perfect, this does it. You know, it's simple enough. I'm rapping about my daughter. They don't even check in or clue in that. I'm pushing my daughter on the swing immediately. And I love I love a reveal. I love things that aren't too obvious or too literal. Um, even that whole, I don't even call that really a film. It's like an audio visual trip. I spent just as much time on putting together the picture as I did the sound design. If not, I might have spent more time on the sound design of that than than anything, you know, because I'm a, I'm a sound guy. That's how I make my bread and butter. And I honestly, truly believe that the right music should be enjoyed with no visual. It should be enjoyed one-on-one, -on -one, you know, or with a small group of people respecting that music, not talking over it, kind of closing their eyes and going wherever the music takes them. And I think sometimes giving the visual robs people of the ability to then imagine something, you know? Um, there's a, like a lot of my music, I see something distinct or I see a distinct color and then I talk to somebody and they saw something completely different. You know, and maybe if I had shot a video for that song, I, I might have robbed them of that. You know, they might not have ever been able to have the blank canvas to go wherever they wanted to go. It's such a delicate balance of, you know, adding on and then also it's, it's like we were talking about the good book 
or great book and then the movie you know sometimes like the movie takes away from the book and sometimes it doesn't when it's done well right. um dw Rui's watching that is there anything you think of or what's your reaction to to what we just watched from sean i think i think it makes you feel and i think that that's something that's very hard to do when it comes to visuals we can all show fun images or glossy images but that makes you feel, you feel something. And at the end of the day, that's what a video is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring you even closer to the music and the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very vulnerable piece, to be honest, because, you know, uh, in hip hop, it's supposed to be superheroes for the most part. And to have, like, not only an artist who's a rapper, but a black man smiling and embracing his child like that in a music video, super special. And the sound design is incredible as well, too. I think that's the one thing that I always, especially with the project you just put out, your sound mixes and all that stuff is so intricate and so layered that it's always super impressive. So that's, a, yeah, that's a great piece. Thank you, Wish. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, you, it, that's I, the real superhero. I was gonna ask so, a question you know? too, was have you ever thought of directing for other artists? Yeah, I would love to. I think there's True. a stigma that comes along with being a rapper. So even this film, I put it out under Noel, which is just Leon backwards. <laughs> um, and that made, it, that made it so when people watched it, they would give me their like honest opinion, right? Because some people are gonna say, hey, I love it. And it's because they love me or they know I'm sensitive about my shit, right? Um, but if I can like externalize that and be like, nah, this is somebody imaginary, go, he's not here, say, say what you want. And that's what I really wanted. Like I didn't wanna just shoot this and again, I, I got to shout out my peers that helped me and, and we did all this together. Like, it wasn't just me, like but... family that, like, DW was talking about. Right, like exactly. And, and you, you, you kind of inspire these believers and then they just want to work with you even though you can't give them all the money in the world or you can't guarantee that it's going to be some massive success. Again, like DW said, they just kind of believe in the work. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the seeds, as I mentioned in the intro for this conversation, was the short film, The Gatekeeper. Um, the short film outlines a true story from Jesse's experience of the abuse of power over women um, in the music industry. And it's something that was actually written, recorded, released before Me Too um, really picked up and, and took off, which was really like, amazing foresight, honesty, vulnerability. Um, we're gonna watch a scene from it and then we'll get into it. So powerful, so powerful. Um, one, one of the things just with the particular scene is like you really feel like you're there with Jesse as she's an up and coming singer with a dream unknown. Um, can you talk a little bit about seeing that, having like been there along the journey and and how accurate and how well captured that moment is to where she was at that time? Well, I wasn't there when that happened to her. Oh no, I mean but, I mean like that era of, in terms of like when she, before she was yeah, yeah. you know a name that was known around the world but like you know an artist that had this aspiration this dream um well watching that is tough to watch for me to be honest because it's a real it's, it's a true story it's not even a story it really happened and um and you didn't put the the part in the car which is crazy i don't know how many of you have watched this before but it's it's intense um sorry what's your question yeah it's, and and to that point like i didn't i didn't want to bring that point part into the yeah, conversation yeah. out of no, context. Like I think as people watch that on your own choice, like from start fair. to finish, yeah, but yeah. that just that ability to like convey her vulnerability, her innocence, her hope, like that moment of like being so nervous. And then like, I think we can all relate to those moments where, you know, you think that, wow, things are opening up, like to the point that she's like thanking God for meeting this guy, yeah. not knowing what's ahead, yeah. but just like feeling so close to her dream. And, yeah. and just like the ability to convey that moment that it feels like we were there with her. I think, I mean, I can't speak for her, but I've heard her mention this before, where for her to bring herself back to that place was not an easy thing. And there was even the moment in the vehicle, and 
specifically, I remember uh, the director said he didn't even want to have a rehearsal. They just wanted to go shoot on camera because he wanted to feel very authentic what was happening in the vehicle. And at that point, Jesse obviously when we filmed this is a different person than she was five years prior to this happening, right? So, you know, at that moment she, in, in real life, I believe she was you fucking scared. You're like, you're, you know, it's a terrifying moment and it, you now start questioning a lot's going through your head. You know, and everybody's had those moments when, you know, you have to make a decision in a split second and I don't know if it's to that level for everybody, obviously, but more some than others. Um, but when they went through it and rehearsed, uh, when they shot, she was, she forgot she was acting. So she was, what, now this is five years later and, you know, she's uh, more comfortable and confident in who she is as a person. So she's not scared. At, she just is like sweating because she's about to like rip this guy's head off, who's an actor, obviously. But, you know, it stirs up real emotions. Um, and that's, a, again, that's just another superhero, man. It's just like putting such vulnerability on camera for the purposes of sharing your story and also presenting that to the world. So I don't think she did it for the purpose of saying, like, I'm better than that. It's just I want to put this out to the world to know that this happens and this is my reality. And because we talked on the phone and saying like, you know, us trying to figure out a music video for this was like, it was a challenge because at first it was like, I knew the story, you know, and but it wasn't shared with many people. And so we were trying to figure out a way to do this in like this artistic way, the uh, a music video with the song. And we just couldn't figure it out. And then to a point where Jesse was on the phone with Peter Huang, who's an incredible director. He's done some amazing things. Um, and she just conveyed the entire story of like how, what what made her write about that song. And then at that point, it was just like that. Peter's like, wow, this is incredibly powerful stuff. And I don't see any other way to do this except for a short film. And I think as Jesse was telling the story, she was also realizing that there's only one way to tell this. And that's through a short film and then a music video piece. And uh, I don't, shout out to her for the bravery that that takes, because it's not easy. Yeah, and I remember uh, she and I had a conversation about it when it just dropped. Um, and like it, I think everyone who saw it was really impacted and, and I was impacted by it. And, and what she said was like, you know, just she wants women in the industry, especially young women coming up, like go to the meetings with your parents if you can, like go with people. Like To just, this day, yeah. Jesse, even if it's a producer that is well established, she will not go in there unless Byron or myself is in that room, yeah. one of her managers. She just won't because she's like, I don't give a fuck who's in. I don't care if you have 50 plaques on your wall platinum. I'm not going in there unless I know somebody that's in there that's going to make sure that like I feel good about it. You know, yeah, and it's not about her not feeling safe because she's a woman. It's just like I'm not, I'm not putting myself through that. Yeah, you know? and I think like the that intent. You know, it's one thing in terms of going through the process and saying maybe you want to do this video. Was, you know, write the song. That's one thing. Record the song. To shoot, decide yeah. to put it, and then out, and then to say we're gonna do a video, but moving from let's do something kind of not literal and kind of abstract, and then saying no, we're just gonna tell the story. We're not going to tell the story in a video. We're going to enact so many of these moments yeah. with that. I know one of the things she said was the intent, one of the intents was that other women in the industry would really see like how to protect themselves. Yeah. You know, and, and um, opening that up, which is was such a powerful and, and remarkable thing to do at, you know, especially an artist that's like not known to the world. Yeah, absolutely. At that point, right? Like she's she's just emerging. Still uh, is. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> she's know, a, she's a rock biased. star. And I, I just want to say, like, uh, if I could just ask some men, yeah. like, every time I watch that, it, I, it just hurts my heart. Um, and it's the emotion is real, and even just the way she's telling the story and recapping it in that scene with the the natural light, and it's just so well put together. And just shout out to Jesse, like if you guys are on to Jesse, if you guys want to support Jesse, like she's a Toronto real one, like she deserves that support. So please, thanks. Yeah, you guys, you know what it is, man.
Yeah, and she, and she, I think like what's been interesting too is like all of the music she's put in, like this went to a very deep place, but I think there is a consistency when you say a real one, like in the sense of she really is coming with music and visuals that are breaking down a lot of walls. Yeah, she comes from an honest place like all the time, yeah. you know, and like, and I'm not, it's not to stir up controversy, but it's like, there's some people that are like, how do you get on a record with Eminem? He hasn't been the most, you know, he said some hateful shit in his life and it's just like, that's fair. But this is, it's like, this is her expressing herself at that moment. So when she's saying suck my, you know, on a record, it's just because that's just how she feels. As a human being, you sometimes feel the type of way. And I'm not excusing what Eminem has done because I heard we heard the album the same time that everybody else did. So when there were certain words that were used, and it's not to excuse what he's, he's done, but you know, fortunately, he went and said, like, I regret using that word because that's something that is not only hurting this individual, but it's hurting a lot of other people, which is good to, you know, I mean, for him, as a, he's an older man now at this point, to say, like, that's, have that responsibility. Still shouldn't have said it, but, you know, Jessie will just, she's not somebody that's going to go into a studio and make music for the sake of a hit record. She's not going to go in there and say, like, if you want me to, like, put out the next Bruno Mars record or something to produce, she's just not doing it. She'll just, I'm going to tell you what's in here, and that's how every great artist operates these two right here are like you're putting amazing visuals on camera just as you are with the music as well too like that comes from a real place or else we in the room collectively wouldn't be able to feel that yeah and i, I think that is a consistent thing regardless of how, how different the work is each of you do i think that was what i saw as like a unifying thing is where you're coming from when you're creating it um dw we're going to show something yours but i wanted to see if was there anything you wanted to add about this conversation, like watching that that piece? Well, I think just to set up the next piece, uh, the first piece that you guys saw was like the climax of these two girls um, kind of dancing around each other and one was in a relationship and it takes place over two days and that montage kind of spans over the uh, a two-week affair. And it was really interesting to me to take this song and tell a story through a montage of everything that's happening in two weeks rather than playing it out in scenes, just similarly to how Jesse wanted to do a music video that was more of a short. There's different ways to approach different scenes, whether it be a short film, a web series, uh, and, a, and a music video. And then contrary to that, this music video I did for Princess Century, um, you could break it down that it's literally one person walking across a room over the course of a music video. But it's how I kind of like broke it down in a different way and lust and a little bit more kind of artsy and, and abstract. So yeah, approach and perspective is really interesting thing that you get to play with in music videos. Let's check it out. Yeah, so I mean, the, one of the first things, like there's a dynamic to that video, which is for me, in one sense, the visuals really match the feeling and the sound, even the change of color and the way things, when the music drops down, how it switches. But then never in a million years, no matter how many times I listen to that song, would I picture a, someone with a pink lollipop for a head, <laughs> right? So it's like, um, I mean, honestly, I have no idea how I came up with that. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But it, it popped into my head. And the great thing about working with no Princess Century, actually, <laughs> uh, she let me go nuts. The deal was I really want to use her track in That's My DJ. Uh, a theme in That's My DJ season two and in this music video is the idea of being attracted to somebody that's unexpected and how that makes you feel and how it makes you reconsider who you are and your values and your sexuality. And if you go for it or resist and the kind of chaos that happens around you. So season two explores that. This music video explores it but in a very different way. So in exchange for her lending this song to That's My DJ Pro Bono, which was very lovely of her, she's like, do me a music video. I was like, oh, okay, to, to the same track? Because I've kind of already used it in episode four of the series. Uh, and she's like, yeah. So I had to think outside the box of something I had already done, kind of making a second music video. And I have no idea how, 
this popped into my head, but it did. And it was so great to have that creative freedom to explore different camera angles, different post techniques. Um, just something so simple of seeing somebody across a room and being curious, like just at a base level. And again, I had a very tiny, tiny, tiny budget, but I had the people around me who believed in me, believed in the pitch, believed in the track, uh, and kind of rallied together, and we did an overnighter in this random laundromat on the east side. It was bananas. Um, one of the things with that is, like, I know there's no lyrics in it, right? So it does leave itself open. And I know, Ruiz, you are talking about some of your earlier work with EDM artists where there's not much lyrics, if any, and a lot of those artists didn't want to be in the video. It leaves things so open to interpretation. Like, how do you, maybe, I mean, you've given the story of this one, but how do you overall find that balance between um, making visuals that do connect to the music and tell the story, but then also bringing in something that, you know, is not necessarily part of the song, but elevates it? Like, it's, it's a, rather than it being a distraction or, like, it really does feel like this song was made for, like, a guy with a pink lollipop for a head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After I've seen it. Yeah. Um, how, do, how do you, I guess, not just walk that balance, but what are your thoughts on, on that tension between, you know, pushing something, mm -hmm. a project too far out from what was really going to elevate it, but also not being so literal? I think it comes down to if the band will let you or the artist you're working with, or if it's your own project, finding the story within you, what's happening in your life. What are the things that you're struggling with that you're dealing with? Cause you have to tell your own story. Don't just watch another film and be like, Oh, I'm going to do what Tarantino's doing. If I heard another dude in my film class say that I was going to fucking kill myself. Like tell your story. And it's your story that we're not hearing, uh, from so many different people from the LGBTQ community, from women, from people of color. Like those are the stories we're craving right now because we haven't had, as many of them and I, th I think it's important to bring yourself to the project and bring your experiences to the project and be vulnerable it's terrifying uh the most vulnerable i've been with a project was season two of that's my dj and that's brought me the most success because people connect with it because it's a story a lot of people haven't seen and if you're scared it's probably a good thing well i, I was having this conversation um with joseph at, um with sunday school um, right before where we're talking about the adage that when you try to be general and appeal widely you actually alienate more people mm -hmm. by going super personal and super specific you actually make what you're doing more universal mm -hmm. um and and i think like pe you know people watching season two of that's my dj may not might not necessarily live in the nightlife mm -hmm. or you know have maybe they haven't been in a relationship where they're questioning their sexuality but there are by being so specific there's so many things that any that you can find and that you connect to because it's just real it's raw it's open it's vulnerable and then it's well told totally and at the end of the day you know the details of those moments that moment at 2 a.m where like things were crazy and you felt so pulled and this was the moment that you're gonna be telling your friends for the next two weeks about how intense it was. You know how intense that moment was, so you know where that edit needs to get to on screen. For you to make up a scenario of what this character would feel, that's gonna be harder to kind of represent and reenact and pull through a music video or a short film or whatever it is. Sean, what are your thoughts on that in terms of walking that line of vulnerability? Like I think, we look at your work and it is so vulnerable, but we can't assume that it's an easy thing to do. Yeah, I'm still stuck on her visual. I thought that was super dope. It was one location. Um, I thought the shot, the angles were amazing. Um, I, I thought that was like super dope. Can we just clap for that one more time? Thank you. That's I, I on feel YouTube? Like Everything's on YouTube? Pardon? The series, That's My DJ, that's all on YouTube? Yeah, That's My DJ is all on YouTube. There's three seasons. Yeah, it's tough to make one location like interesting for that long like that's not easy to do and that head what was that paper mache we reached out to like an ocad artist and i was like okay gotcha. call me crazy Shout but i have this photo yeah how big this. was it like it was big i had it in my house forever and i finally just had to part ways yeah <laughs> that thing yeah um yeah sorry um that's what good art's supposed to do anyway it's supposed to kind of stop you Jolting but you. um as far as vulnerability like um 
I don't know. I'm 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 a sensitive person and and uh I don't hide that about myself. You know, that's actually why I put sports down and I think I gravitated more towards art because I feel like that was more ap appreciated in art. It was almost celebrated a lot of times whereas that vulnerability in sports was like attempted to get like beat out of me not physically beat but it's like trained like no there's no weakness like you know pain is is weakness leaving the body like all that bullshit right um so for me it's like i i just i don't know i'm a, I'm a big fan of the people in my life you know they make me who i am they inspire me every day um i feel like a movie I feel like the camera's always on me. I feel like the people in my life are also movies as well. And sometimes I just want to like pay homage to them. You know, it's just I want to tell their stories or I uh, want to put them on a platform, you know, shine shine a bit of light on, on on them, you know, and that. And like the vulnerability thing is like, I mean, it can be tough. Like it can be tough to like yes, be on record and, at, and talking about certain things and and then being in a party situation and that record's being played and I got to relive this maybe painful moment. Like I got to relive it over and over again. But I feel like as an artist, like similar to what Jesse did with Gatekeeper, it's almost like a responsibility. You know, I feel accountable. I feel like I need to do that, you know, and it helps me um, just deal with that um, that pain, you know. It's like just visiting it, revisiting it, revisiting it until I can, you know, convey that to somebody else and maybe that'll, that'll help them, you know. And, and I appreciate you saying that because I think looking at your work and how vulnerable it is from the outside looking in, you just might assume that it's easy for you to do that and you sharing that shows that like it isn't it's it's a choice you're making but it's also a sacrifice you're making yeah like sometimes i, I regret 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 putting my baby girl um on camera you know like i'm i, I fight it every day because i'm i'm proud of her like just you know everything she does you know it could be anything you know but you know she's just, she's just a superstar like she's my god you know, so I'm like, I wanted, I wanted, like, yo, you have to see what Zylo just did. Like, you have to see it. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, this is like, she's, you know, I'm so protective over her as well. So I, I try to, like, you know, it is difficult. It is well, very I'm difficult. I'm grateful you shared it. And I know yeah. a lot of people here definitely were moved by that. Um, one of the things I did want to get into was Sean was talking, you are talking about great music sometimes doesn't need a visual associated to it um, but can stir up its own visual so the next piece that we're going to play is from sean leon the death of um, it's a clip within the 32 minute piece that is like really like a visual or audio story it's a soundscape um, and yeah, just offer it up to everyone, however you listen best, eyes closed, eyes open, looking around, looking at the person in front of you, whatever it is, um, this is just gonna be audio. The whole thing, well, I'll, I will say that, that you know, I've listened crazy. to it. Um, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I've listened to it four times, yeah. just like 32 minutes in. And I would say to everyone here, like, give yourself that gift of carving out 32 minutes where you're not hey, doing man, anything man. else. You just start to finish. Like, let yourself listen because it's really intentionally and, you know, beautifully designed for that. Yeah. Um, and it was so hard to choose, like, yeah. you know, less you than 32 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I think you picked a good part because yeah. those, two, that, those two moments and... There was a separate moment. Uh, in the beginning is my sister talking to me about uh, a Tinder date where she went on where she assumed or was suspicious of the guy because it seemed like he was on this date because he knew that she was my sister, <laughs> right? So she was Anything going through those on, motions. Wow, and then, wow. uh, which is awkward, man. Like, don't even start on that. Um, and then that second one is, I mean, you have to know the context of the story. It's called Sean Lee on the death of, I've been going through a lot of changes. Um, and that's that second part is called close my eyes when I'm dead. And it's just like, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but it was kind of like, it comes maybe 15, 16 minutes in. And I wanted to kind of have the listener be aware of the second 
consciousness. Like it feels like when you're listening to the record. I mean, I hope it feels like you're kind of dialing and getting into my head, like you walk into my head. Um, and it's like I wanted people to realize that there was like a whole outside world within that, which is why I have that that girl. She actually walked into my house. Um, I was doing this event in my backyard. Um, and I had just a bunch of artists, a bunch of creatives, all kinds of people. Um, and I was in my studio just like working on music and she just walked in to use the bathroom and that was her genuine reaction as I was playing music. And it just so happened that because I was recording the crowd outside just to get that chatter, that real Parkdale energy, um, I had left that, that recorder on so I had caught her um, saying that. And I just thought like this is so genuine and authentic, like I want to have that in there. Um, I also want people to know that as epic as that project is, my next album is already like in progress and it is almost already completed and I am ready to do that wow. too. Wow. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to kind of preview, preview those, those two moments um, and just enough to make people like, you know, want to hear those songs later. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate it. You know, like a lot of people have been saying some really nice things about it. Like my boy Daniel Caesar. I don't know if you guys know Daniel Caesar says something super nice about it. So I, I printed it on a T-shirt because um, that's my little bro. I'm super proud of him. Um, Yo, if, if Daniel Caesar ever tweets about what I'm doing, I'm making a T-shirt. Yeah, too. you go I'll right. Tweet, Makes yeah. sense. Okay. So um, yeah, yeah. And that whole project is like, we're, we're. I mean, I'm in collaboration with Free. We're supposed to do something here at Free Space. Um, I think next month. Um, and even just like when I play that record, I'm trying to find creative ways to play the record without having to involve a visual, you know, whether it be blindfolds, you know, whether it be like a cinema and you turn the screen on. I don't want to reveal too much, but you just turn the screen on. It's just a black screen and you're just listening to this audio and you're letting it take you wherever you want to, wherever it takes you. And then I'd love to have a conversation about where, what you saw, you know, things like that. It's funny you say that because that, that was one of the things I wanted to put to the audience. Like we took that time to listen if anyone wants to just kind of shout out like what are some things that you visualize like what are some things that came to mind listening to that anybody yeah yeah i love that idea because i somebody had told me that it feels like that 32 minute project feels like the first digital vinyl because it's something that you kind of just press play and then it goes all the way through and then you go back that's a great idea you mind if i steal that from you Okay. Are you gonna say, what was the? Oh, for me. If you can just say it as loud as possible. Uh, for me, I felt like I was watching a movie and it was really challenging. But and so every single time I would listen to it, I would feel like I had a new chapter. I still feel like that new kind of experience that I had with Jimmy. Like confrontation, maybe like so far or something. Oh my God, he's on Tinder. Yeah. Yeah. And they switch over. Oh my God, this is great. And then you also had like a. Right. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of how life is. Like, that's how I interpret life sometimes. It's like, you know, I could be in a great mood and then I can get hit with a bombshell. I can get a text, I can witness something, and my entire demeanor, my entire energy change. You know what I mean? Like, I'm having a good time right now. Somebody raises their hand and attacks me. My energy might be slightly different, right? And I can't control that. I can't control what happens to me. I can only control how I react to it. So, you know, a lot of it is like is like that. And I don't really believe in like fade outs and like, you know, long pauses in between unless, you know, the moment calls for that. I like to kind of grab your attention and keep it until I'm like finishing what I want to say, you know? So even the project, it like loops. Like I'm hoping people got it on repeat one and yeah. it's just like, you well, know. I, a couple of times I was in on a commute listening and you get to the end and before you realize it, it's, right back in the basement yeah, and you're stuck. we're talking yeah. about the dream um, yeah and that's like again like how um dw's visual just like stopped me just now and i was like just thinking of just trying to break it down in my head really quick you know how she was able to do all that in that one scene it's like that's the same thing i want to do you know like, musically is is grab you and hold on to you um and make you like a fan like a believer you know as an independent artist like that's key you know it's making people believe um, and again, we all got our own social media. We all, we all got our own pages. And it's like, how do I get people to log out of whatever they're doing and pay attention to me 
when there's no massive company saying this is the guy, when there's no major label or even like independent label saying this is the guy to pay attention to. You know, like how do I just get people off the work to want to be like, nah, I got to tune in. Whatever this guy's doing, I got to support, you know, things like that. Well, and I think it's the care you put in, you know, because um, you can feel that. I, there was, I think, one more, another reaction. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, so uh, I was actually, I don't really know who really works on me. I actually told my buddy Mark, I was reading through the thing, and I, and I saw your, your name, and he's like, you don't know Sean? And so, um, I mean, I love that. I think it was such a visceral experience. I felt like it wasn't really... It was more than just music. I got felt I did feel a consciousness thing at one point. I felt like I was inside your head, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm definitely interested to look into you now. So I, I'm yeah, probably please do, man. Yeah, please man. Do. I like the shit, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You know what it reminds me of? You watch Usual Suspects? Pardon me? You watch Usual Suspects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, what's his name? Um, Kevin Spacey. Right. And, Benicio Del Toro and what does he and play again? What's the name of the guy? Verbal Kent. Right. Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze. Right. So that's my favorite movie, like of all time. And um, the ending, yeah. There's a mix at the ending when he's going through like the process of like Kobayashi's from the bottom of the mug and right. like that sound mix. They went through like a month trying to figure that out. Right. So I compare it to that, which is right. to me my favorite. Thank shit you, world, thank so. you, thank you, great. thank you, thank you. I love this guy, man. Fuck it's my big homie, man. He's, he's well, bigger than me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And um, DW, I know one of the things that we were talking about was to that point of like the the mixing and looking at how those details can bring a visual to life without even a visual. But when there is a visual, those sound elements as well are important. And you're a DJ and a director. You continue to do both. Can you share a little bit about how being a DJ affects how you direct and how being a director affects how you DJ? Yeah, I think everything I've learned from directing in regards to setting up a story, telling a story, kind of bringing an audience on a journey, I brought into the DJ world in the sense of when I go on stage, I need to grab people's attention. I need to have an intro. I have to have something cinematic kind of happening. I ended up writing a song called Intro. that was extremely cinematic and worked really well in the club to kind of stop people from being at the bar or talking to each other or whatever and look at the stage to be like, what is about to happen. And from there, I kind of arc my DJ sets like a film, kind of like building to a climax and then wrapping it up at the end. Um, and it's more of like a subconscious thing. And then I feel like from DJing, what I've brought over to directing is learning how to captivate an audience. I have to get drunk person number one, drunk person number two, their hunt, MDMA, they're high on E, they're high on Coke. That person's sober, that person doesn't know where they are. And I have to get them to all sign up to the same journey. Do you, and still, I, do you still drum? When, when I do, DJ? yeah. I DJ and I play drums at the Shit same time. Shit is crazy. Wow. Like, I've seen video footage of it. I've never been personally. Yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm so ashamed to say that. But, like, I've seen a video clip of her DJing. And then you were in a cheerleader outfit? And from, yeah, And yeah. you just started fucking wailing on drums. I was like, yo, this is crazy. Like, it's an experience. It is an experience. And I think that's what's kind of missing in the yeah. clubs right now is, you know, we see a DJ go up and they perform. I don't know if that's really performing. Um, and they play a set that that's what they've decided. And then they play it other than that that's done. But for me... I think it's so important to read a crowd and read a room. And that's something as a director I've learned how to do too. When, you know, wardrobe's pissed off, you can't just ignore that. When your actors are having a down day, when it's rainy outside and everybody's coming late to set, that affects what you're doing just the same way that people coming to a bar and don't know who you are, it's going to affect your performance. So learning how to read a room and kind of adjust well, the songs I'm To read I'm them choosing. is one thing, but to move them off of that yeah. read as well, right? Which is like that next level that I think you're talking about. I think generally being an artist nowadays, and I'm sure you guys can relate, we're battling so much. Like I'm against your cell phone. Anything that you can possibly wanna watch is in the palm of your hand. And I have to convince you to pay attention to what I'm doing to get everybody on the same page so we can all have an experience together. Because I think that's a lot of what we're missing in this world is experiencing something together. We don't go to movies anymore. We watch it at Netflix at home. We don't really go to, you know, people go to bars, but concerts even. Still, like all of our venues in Toronto are, are shutting down. Where are we supposed to find new music and support new local artists and have that experience of, of going and seeing this local artist nobody's ever heard of and being like, 
like, yo, were you there last night? Oh my God, I was so sweaty in this. And I remember leaving a girl talk show before a girl talk was girl talk. And no lie, I left like I just took a shower. Like everybody was dripping wet head to toe. And I was like, I can't believe that just happened. I was so present. And I think being present is a hard thing to get to nowadays. And I think that that's what artists are ultimately trying to do is to get us to all be present together. Yeah, and that's that's why I would say, you know, like with Seishan's project, like give yourself that gift. Like I know that that as small as 32 minutes sounds, like when you look at the speed of our lives and our attention spans and, and just how we go through our days, like, you know, it's rare. A lot of people don't actually give themselves, never mind 32 minutes to listen to song, like five minutes to like have a little reflection in the morning before you're like, boom, 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 let's go. So I think like th that point of the power of art to, to stop you mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know we have one more clip, one more question, then we want to open up things to the audience. Um, so the clip that we're going to go into I'll just set it up for a second. I think we're talking about narrative, we're talking about you know cinematic visuals, the quality of camera effects, lighting, and all these kind of things. But um, sometimes like a really minimalist approach can be the most powerful thing. So you know Jesse Reyes um, figures, one of the you know first songs that we saw from her is just white background pretty much the whole time. She's expressing just raw emotions, but it's like you feel like you're moved through the story and the one we're gonna watch though is uh, Daniel Caesar, best part, also um, produced by Mad Ruck, and um, has a similar, very simple, very minimal, but very powerful story. I know everyone's like, why did you stop it at Daniel's verse? <laughs> um, <laughs> just time is of the essence, but. Um, yeah, like, again, you, you see right away, it's not complicated, it's like, you could probably set that up off of, like, phones at this point in terms of those shots, but how the movement, the simplicity of it, if you can talk a little bit about two things, like, that approach with both figures and, and this, and also some of the references that you are inspired by and look at where there's other really minimalistic, really simple storytelling. I know you're talking about some before. Yeah, I wasn't there for best part, but that that was very complicated. So, cuz they have to have a steady cam operator on sand. That's next level difficult. So, you need Is, is it similar to like trying to run in sand? Like 10 times harder than just stand running with on like a 40 50 yeah. pound piece of equipment in your hand, right? So, it's it that that wasn't easy. And coordinating two very popular artists as well too it comes with its challenges as well. Um, but I can't speak too much to it. I just know that it was, it was a difficult shoot, and that one of them shot in the morning, the other one is shot at in the evening, All right? So it's contrast well, and balance there. I think there. for for my question, more so is about like that kind of minimalist no, approach, no, and, right? And some of the references that you've looked at, like for figures and, and right, just right. other yeah, examples yeah. of. Well, no, I mean, even though that that particular video, what I was gonna say is complicated. It's so simple, but so like visually stunning, right? Um, there's a story being told there with the cameras, with like the performance. And there's, that's also a big part of this as well too. So back to even what you said earlier, not to go too much into it, but I agree. I don't know if there is like a more narrative in films today as opposed to 20 years ago. I don't think so either. But because you have these amazing visuals like this that just connect and with like Jesse Reyes, for example, for figures, I can speak to that because I was there. And that, to be honest, that music video, I, I shouldn't say this book is a shit. Like, there's like a $500 budget. And that's like a Kino flow. That's me working a camera light and her performing in front of a camera. And the studio cost was a couple hundred bucks. And like, you know, and but it just connected. It was just the right, the right visual. And uh, to, the reference point to me was um, the D'Angelo record and these Alanis Morissette records from the 90s. I'm such a 90s baby. So like... I was like, I remember watching those videos and being like, oh, this is like, this is captivating and it's capturing because there's a, there's obviously a story being told through the words, but just this static um, video, right? Like just uh, the one take 
for example, and it's the first time I ever saw that back in the day. And then I was just like, I think this is the perfect song for it. Mind you, leading up to it, <laughs> leading up to it, there was like discussion. I don't say argument, but discussion of like a one take video and yeah. like what, like if we should, and Jesse's like, nah, we got to shoot this and this. And we're like, nah, we got it. And we're just going back and forth. So we shot a bunch of other stuff that day, but then we're like, let's just try the one take. And Zach Fax was actually shooting that. And um, who did the shooters video with Tori and, and did Sean's video as well. One and, um, and then uh, we're like, let's just do the one take. And then by the time it was done, Byron was looking at it and we were watching it. We're like, yo, I think that's the video. And Jesse's like, nah, that's, Really, you guys are tripping, and then we watch it back. Like, oh, that's that's it right there. So, um, well, what what I love about what you're sharing, even the difference between the Daniel and the Jesse videos, is from a viewer's point. Like, if you don't know about the steady cam and how hard that is to do in the sand and all that kind of stuff, like they look similar in the sense of something very minimal. Like, this is the same background. It's some movement through it, but it's the the music and the words Connection. that are really like. Yeah telling the story and, and, and the visual just kind of provides like an arena for that story to be seen. Um, yeah, so you need sometimes. But then the scale is interesting too, because like the two very simple stories, but one is the scale of the, of the Daniel Caesar video as you're, as you're sharing with us is like much more than one room, couple hundred dollars. And, yeah. You know, well, that, the, the figures video is also at a necessity, right? Like yeah. we, it's got louder, no? Yeah. <laughs> it's out of necessity because we, this is like Jesse, the independent artist. Like, there's no fucking money for that when we did that. So, like, $500 is like a, is a conversation, a very real conversation. And even though I have a production company called Mad Ruck, we're, we're not going to, I'm not going to put the money down, I, you know, for that just because it's the artist that I'm working with. We got to figure it out. So, that was out of necessity. Um, so I don't, I don't know if she was with a major label. If we would have done the same thing, to be honest, uh, I, but it's it worked out for me for my as an intro to Jesse. For as, everybody, that's as, the first yeah, song that like, she really put out. To be yeah, honest, yeah, it worked beautifully. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you know, again, we were talking about really practical takeaways. One of the things I wanted to bring in the conversation, um, I know, Mauricio, you're on the steering committee or advisory for the MVP project. So shout out to the, shout out to them as well. RBC, yeah, so, put together a grant. It's yeah, we like, want to talk a little bit about that. So RBC Music and Prism Prize um, MVP project is about bringing musicians and art, like artists and filmmakers together. There's um, an October 1st grant round on January 15th, and we actually have Neil and Amara who are here today. Hey. Hey. Yeah, so, hey. Um, they're going to be, so there's a free sign, the free sign in the very front. Like Y'all should stand up. Stand up. Talk yeah. to them afterwards. Yeah. Yes. These, and she's there. like, nah. She's so, like, nah. <laughs> no, because they're heroes, actually. Because, yeah. you know, we, we lost a grant called Much Fact that was helping a lot of young and up-and-coming artists. Yeah. And now they have taken that baton, and they're doing the same thing. So, like, that's a massive thing. That's a massive thing. Thank you. Thing. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so there's two things I want to get into about that. One is just the really practical. When all this is said and done, by the free sign, um, they'll be over there. So if you are a filmmaker, an artist, you're working with either and you're interested in finding out about those grants, how best to position your project and your idea for that, the supports around it, what the vision is, they're here, they have cards and all that. So we wanted like a really practical resource that people can, can walk away with on this story. And then um, if you can just a little bit more about what, what the overall vision for the grants are and the project from what you know about it. Um, and just the importance, if all of you can talk to the importance of getting a little bit of money to put together an idea and, and what that can mean in terms of how you build your career, whether you're on the music side or the visual storyteller side. Yeah, I believe that they're, like you said, they're gonna be um, providing grants for filmmakers and artists. I think it's from, uh, is it 10K or 15K per project? Five to 15. Five to 15? 500 to 15K. Yeah, yeah five grand to, to 50. Or 500 dollars, I think, right? 500. Five. Oh, 5K to 5, 15K. Okay, to, yeah, to 15K. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's just honestly just for up and coming artists who, um, up and coming artists, both the musician and the directors and the producers or whoever it may be, to get their, their projects and their ideas out to the world. And if, you know, 
providing a, a bit of a budget, which is such a blessed thing, to be honest, because America doesn't have that, and we do. Can you, can uh, <laughs> DW, Sean, either you want to add on in terms of just, um, I think some people might think about it and be like, mm, I don't know if I'm yeah. ready for that. I don't yeah. know if I should apply. I yeah, I would say, you know what it reminds me of the most? The grant system kind of reminds me of when you're finishing high school and they're telling you to apply for all these scholarships and you don't. And then we find out that like 80% of the scholarships weren't even, um, like nobody had even applied for them. Like I know it can seem really um, overwhelming and there's like a lot of administrative work and, but it's it's always worth it to try, you know, because I, I tried maybe four or five years in a row to get this factor grant. It took me like five years. And I don't know if you guys know about that, but they show you like your grade. Mm -hmm. So it's demoralizing, right? <laughs> like they show you how much you didn't get it, really it like, like all that. Yeah, they show you like if you were off like 5%, like try again, you know, but I, I finally got it and it made my life so much easier um, just to create. So like, you know, really like, you know, go for it. Like, you know, really like have those conversations, like do some research, Google them, figure it out. Because like Rui said, like we are very fortunate to be in Toronto, to be in Canada, to have access to these things. Yeah, ask the questions, especially if they're here. Ask the question. There's no no such thing as a stupid question. Don't ever think that. Ask the questions how inexperienced you think you might be because you never know what the answer is going to be. And then you, you're building a relationship. Mad Ruck didn't get a grant for two years through much fact, but I stayed sending them emails and maybe I like annoyed them a little bit, but I didn't give a fuck because I'm trying to figure it out. So that's what you got to do as well too. Figure it out and ask the questions. You want to add anything, W? Um, funny enough, I've never applied for a grant or I've gotten a grant in my life. Everything I've done has been through Indiegogo or self-financing because it's kind of like the moment of inspiration and then we want to go for it. I think I've always been really intimidated by grants. I think being a queer woman, I've been really intimidated by grants. Uh, and generally, I'm a visual person. So s sitting down and reading all of these rules and regulations and then having to spit out an essay, not my strongest point in school, um, that's intimidating. And when I heard about this grant, I don't know why, but I was very excited by it. And there seems to be a lot of inspiration and energy behind it, which is not like a lot of other grants. There seems to be r really great eyes kind of looking for talent and support. And I think I would encourage anybody else who can identify, like I identify more of a visual person and not so strong and kind of like the writing stuff to find your team member, find somebody who is strong um, when it comes to those kind of elements and build your team and build your family. And yeah, exactly what you said, like take your shot, ask questions and, and get out there. Cause I have learned over the past couple of years that I have missed out on, on some grants and some opportunities. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I think to that point, Sean, you made or, and building on what you said, DW is that uh, yes, a lot of people don't apply for the grants, like the scholarship example, I think is a good one, but a lot of the granting agencies also, they'll take a call. They'll give you feedback on your application if you are sending stuff early or on your project or your idea or like, and, and that's another thing that a lot of people don't leverage is you feel like, oh, well, I just have to get it perfect and then send it in and see what happens blindly versus like you actually can if you, if that's not your forte, uh, to be able to go call people, email them, share what your project is and they'll, they'll let you know like, oh, half of what you want to get funded is not eligible, but this part is. So shift that because first. it's also information for them as well so when you are actually contacting them and putting and, and communicating with them they might not know who you are but once you communicate they'll look into who you are and be, oh they actually got some dope shit so then the, the conversation becomes like oh we have to potentially we have to look at funding this person or working forget funding just working with this individual yeah. right so you're informing them as well at the same time when you're communicating with them it's a two-way thing and, and they can get excited about Absolutely. the fact that you are applying. Um, questions? Want to see if there's any questions out there? I've got one right here. Um, I think there might be a mic for our audience. I don't know if there is. Oh, yeah, it is. Shout out Simone. Thank you so much. Hey, testing one, two. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Flavia. Um, this question is for Sean. I love how the first video that. Um, you guys showed you were really creative with putting the TED talk in the music video 
Did you get clearance for that? Or did Absolutely you... not. Did they see contact how, you? See how after? I do it? Yeah. See how I do it? You know, like, I'm living an honest life, and I think I'm a good person. <laughs> and this lifestyle isn't cheap. It isn't cheap, and I got yeah. a lot of mouths to feed. So yeah. sometimes I'll just take that risk. And, like, if, it, if, if that happens, like, you know, cease and desist, like, again, with that Firestorm video that I put up, I got a cease and desist. They asked me to take it down. So I took it down, but that was after other fans had already ripped the video out and put it up. So it still exists to this day because they can't, they can't get everybody. And it's like, I, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> you know, like, I, when, I hear, when I hear myself say it, I'm like, yo, you know, like, really? But it's like... What, what, what can I do? Like, this thing spoke to me. Like, I remember being in the studio depressed. And the studio was in some fancy studio. It's my friend's living room. And I'm depressed. I'm going back and forth from Ajax, because that's where my mom lives. We're broke. We're homeless. We're having this baby. And I'm still making this album, which is coincidentally called I Think You've Gone Mad. And I was going crazy, right, making this record. And it was like, I don't know. That fear can't. That fear wasn't going to stop me from, like, using that to convey this message. Nowadays, I'm a bit more careful, you know, because like, you know, some of the songs are blowing up and I don't want to lose 100% of my publishing. But like, at, at a certain point, you got to just be like, like art is stealing in a way. You know, there's, co there's people that just copy and imitate and they're kind of annoying, but like, there's just, I think, a necessary, like you just got to do it sometimes. And like whatever happens, happens. And then like if I get sued, like let's say I sample Drake and he sues me, that's a great headline for me. Drake can take all the publishing Absolutely. and now Sean Leon is right next to Drake on the headline. You know what I mean? And that's just something I got to do at my stage right now. But later on, I might not have to do it. You know what I mean? It's just like that sacrifice. So did anyone ever see it from the TED Talks? Or no? Um, no, no, and I'm low-key hoping that one day I can do a TED Talk. So maybe they reach out and I can, I can flip that conversation and say, you know, here, I'll, let me do a TED Talk. You guys can get all the, the money from it. I don't care. Or, you know, I don't know. You know, yeah, I, 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 guarantee, I, I guarantee somebody in here connected to TEDx Toronto. I'm yeah. sure there Thank is. You. So Sean Leon wants to do one. Yeah, um, cool. Next question. Um, any other questions? Got one right here. Beside me. Are we on? Oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, this, this question goes out to all of you guys. Um, I think a lot of us are fairly hard-headed um, as artists when it comes to, like, giving other people the chance to add to our art and, like, creating it. a team. And so, like, what's your advice? This goes to all of you guys because you guys all have teams on, like, creating that team, um, surrounding your people, yourself with people that care, and then also giving people that trust that, you know, they're going to get your vision out there. If you trust them, empower them. Always, always empower them. You can't do everything. You can't do everything. And some people believe that they can do everything. I know that there's a, the idea, there's a vision. But make sure you have people, your soldiers, to execute that vision. right? And no one's going to do it 100% the way that you think in your mind. But if they get 80%, that's a, that's a passing grade. That's honor roll. So let them fail 20% of the fucking time. That's shit. I mean, I love constantly meeting new people and building my team. Uh, I think it comes down to track record. Like, does this person, like if you call their friends or call other people they've, they've worked for, like do they hustle, do they show up? Are they creative? Are they a team player? Are they great to have on set or in the club or whatever? I think that's a really important uh, thing to follow up on because people can present a persona when it comes to interviews or social situations. So I think kind of just following up in and around the social circle is is really important, but I 100% agree with what you're saying. Like you need to empower people, the people around you and support yeah. them because at the end of the day, they're going to turn around and support you and you're you're building each other up. And there's a saying and somebody's going to know it better than me, but it's like a, a high tide raises all ships. Is that that's right? It. Who is yeah. there or is there a different version of that? Uh, I think that's it. I think yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. long and short is if you build people up in your community, then you're all gonna rise up together. 100%. And there's so many examples of that in the music industry, in the film industry, of communities and, and groups of friends raising up together because they make each other better. And I think that's really important. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's empowerment. Like even the IXXI initiative, whenever we do anything, it's empowered by the IXXI initiative. Right. Just better terminology you know, and communication, but definitely it's like, 
you know, because, you know, people want to do it, you know, like everybody in this room wants to do something, you know, clearly, or they wouldn't be in this room. And sometimes, like even myself, like I need a kick in the pants, man, like I need somebody to kind of get me to not fight, fight myself that morning so I can focus on the task at hand. And sometimes it's as simple as like sending a text, you know, or being like, yo, you did this really well, you know, or like s sending them a reference and like exchanging information you know, like is really good at building a, 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 a relationship, I find, because a lot of people don't want to share information. You know, so it's like we have to clap for Ruiz for trying yeah. to send that pre-production booklet because that's something that he could just hold on to and make life like a little bit difficult, you know, more difficult for us. So I think it's empowerment. Yeah, I never understood that, that like, I'm going to guard my information. Like, my information is for everybody. I I'm stealing that quote from Jay-Z, but like <laughs> that's a that's a real thing though because that means I'm not afraid of like my abilities and and my possibility to become better. And if I can share information with somebody else, you know, I feel like it gives me whatever the word is, but it's like it's good karma. It's also selfish as well because I'm building my network as well. You know what I mean? Nobody's like it's just helpful. To, it's a community thing, and you know I I. I can go on about where I've learned community and stuff, but like make it happen, gang. Shout out, shout out, Remix Project and all that. But I, I think like building on what you're saying, it's that it's are you looking at the world through a lens of scarcity or through abundance, right? If it's scarcity, then you gotta hold your little yeah. piece and keep everybody who's yeah. trying to do something similar out. But if you believe it, like in a world of abundance, then it's like. Yeah. I, you know, there's enough for everybody to do what they have to do. And not only that, it's like by Absolutely. sharing, that person's growing and it's also helping me grow. Absolutely. And the, like in, in our, in the music video, I mean, for Mad Rock, and now we're moving into like content more, right? But in the music videos, I haven't had the ability to really sit down with Kid Studios, but I know Matt Power has, executive producer of Mad Rock, because they're doing incredible shit. And we, and RT at the end, he did it with us. And we did it with Taj and them over there as well, with um, Karina. And also on the music side, like, Jesse Reyes, Camp, Sean, Leon, Daniel Caesar, we're all mad cool with each other. And we share information. I sit down once a month, maybe once every two months, whenever we're in the same city with, with Jordan Evans. And we just share information because, yo, at the end of the day, too, we're from Toronto, and that's America that we're dealing with at the end of the day. So we understand each other a lot better than under trying to understand them. And when we go to LA, I surround myself around Canadians because that's what I that's what I fucking know to be honest. Yeah. And so, yeah. so and we got to share that information with each other because we make each other better. And then that way we can all be in the industry together. It's that's it. Yeah. Um, there's a we have a question over here. Hi, as Susan. Um, first of all, I really appreciate what you said about how if you're confident in yourself, why are you so worried about telling people about anything that you have or do? And also, good energy comes back, so I appreciate it. Anyways, the question that I wanted Thank to ask you. is, um, how do you, we're talking about networking and meeting people, but how do you navigate in a, um, I don't know, like I feel like even the art community, there's a lot of people who who take advantage of you. So how, you need to be naive or you need to make yourself vulnerable to allow yourself to even create art and work together with other people. How do you navigate around that by making yourself vulnerable to other people where they can take advantage of you? And I feel like as artists, you have been taken advantage of more than once. But how do you deal with that? Like, how do you? Repetition is the mother of all learning. Ah, true. So <laughs> if you put yourself in that situation and, and you make yourself vulnerable, it's like that, uh, it's in the book of the outliers, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. Yeah. You do something for 10,000 hours, you become a professional, so you start to learn who you can actually trust. You get a gauge, a sense of like, who's authentic and who isn't, yeah. you know, especially if you've been screwed over before. So, but th that's just, that's, those are the breaks. You learn things, right? Like it's just, it's, there's a, there are obstacles yeah. at the end of the day. So, and then you gotta, you gotta jump over obstacles. The art is not like this. Yeah. It's not. It's never like this. It's it's like this, you yeah. know. But hopefully, it's an upward trend. But you have to put yourself in that situation constantly in order to make sure that it's an upward trend. Just it's as simple as not giving up. It really is, mm -hmm. you know. But learning, being being self aware as well too, and not, you know, I don't think I'm a rapper, even though like like 
I I wanted to be in a band in corn, but I like at a certain you point I'm like this. If you believe in yourself. If I believe in it, but I just believe that I was way better at other things than that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so. Also, your sick freshman corn, like that that heavy metal <laughs> underground world is not talked about in Toronto like at all. Like, and I feel like they were the ones making the rawest music back then. But that's yeah, just totally. my opinion. But yeah, yeah. Yo. <laughs> Any, any questions in the back area at all? Um, so we have two hands in the back, um, and then we'll wrap up with those last two questions. Hi, uh, this question is directed at Sean, but anyone can jump in. Um, I listened to the death of Sean Dion last night, and it, like the ending, when you're kind of talking um, on, I'm not sure what track it is, but you're kind of talking and you're interrupting yourself, it kind of reminded me of something that I recorded when I had a panic attack a couple years ago, and I just wanted to know like how you've dealt with mental health in this industry and like how easy it is or how hard it is for you as a rapper and as someone who likes to be vulnerable, um, just because you touched on it a little bit earlier. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Um, well, I think like before I could target the industry, I had, to, I had to just figure out how to deal with my anxiety and my social stress on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and how I managed that was luckily you know, after bouncing around, bouncing around a few schools, high schools, um, I met this guidance counselor who was a sweetheart, and she brought me to a seminar on mental health. And in that, we discussed the stigmas and what it actually is and what my anxiety actually is. And the more I learned about what it actually was, uh, the more at peace I was. You know, when I first started having those anxiety attacks and I, I couldn't pinpoint why they were happening or what it was and it's like I feel like the scariest thing about those things is that on the inside it's like everything is going wrong but on the outside you look absolutely fine nobody can tell right that's the scariest thing so um, it was like when I got that information about anxiety and how it was almost like a it's like a defense mechanism. It's the same thing that they were using years ago when they were living with saber two tigers, and it was like a defense reflex to like protect them, you know, from, you know, or just living and surviving in those conditions. And then as far as like the industry, like even to touch on what you were saying about not being taken advantage of, it's like, um, I don't know if anybody is completely exempt of that. Like I feel like people are gonna take advantage of you. Like your fans take advantage of you, you know? Like the people you collaborate with take advantage of you, but it's like a give and take. It's like you're, not, you're also taking, we're also taking, you know? Like I'm giving a lot, my fans are demanding the most from me, but then I'm also requesting them to go like really hard for me and they do. So it's almost like you almost have to just accept the fact that that's like part of the game and know where your moral compass lies and like what's too much and, and what's not enough. You know, it's like um, you're gonna work with people and people wake up every day and it's their movie. Again, that's why it's like life when you're in the movie, it's their movie, it's their perspective. Like from my movie, I'm the main character, but from yours, I'm an additional character. You know, this is like our first interaction. So it's like, um, I know people are waking up with their vision in mind and they wanna get whatever they wanna get done. So it's like, um, just not 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 taking offense to that, like not not taking that personal, realizing that's just part of the game. And as far as like my mental health, like sometimes I just turn my phone off. You know, like I'm fortunate enough that I've like surrounded myself with some like people that I can be safe with, that I can like have a good cry with. Like I've been crying so much these last few weeks, it's insane. But there's just been so much going on, you know. And it's like there's nothing wrong with that. That that feels good, you know. So it's like just m making sure that you have that that person or those people around you, I think is more important than anything. Um, Cause it, it, it is a fight. Like every day you wake up and it feels like somebody's punching you in the stomach. You know, every, every like, it's like, it's, it's, it's humbling, you know, being an artist, especially like an independent one, you know, but I think it's just part of the process and we learn from these things, you know? I hope that answers. If not, like I'll definitely be around, we can talk about it. Yeah, no, I did. thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Hi. Um, sorry, that sounded weird. 
Um, I have a quick question. Goes to anybody on the panel right now. Um, I know that you know a lot of people, um, artists, and especially you three, are in I guess a time in your life where you're a little bit more um, I guess comfortable with yourself. Um, you're a little bit more confident in yourself. You know, obviously that confidence is something that's always been embedded in you and always been you know um, planted in you. But you know, it takes that time to grow. Um, so how do you, I guess, navigate, for example, Sean, you were talking about, you know, your sister who, you know, is, you know, she's going on this date or whatever be the case. And, you know, she's kind of skeptical about whether, you know, this person actually likes her or likes the fact that she's connected with you. You know what I mean? So in that, I guess I'll use that to, you know, throw my question out there. How do you, I guess, navigate clout culture? How do you navigate, you know, people trying to I guess, you know, just the question before was talking about being vulnerable. And, you know, the question before that was talking about empower, empowering other people um, in your circle and, you know, in circles that you are, I guess, um, around. So how do, you, how do you navigate that? How do you, what's the best way or what, what experiences um, have you, or what, okay, for example, how, what did you tell, like, what, what discussion did you have with your sister um, for, like, in, in that type of, that type of um, I don't even know the word that I'm looking for right now, in that context. That's a scenario, yeah, that like kind that, of scenario. For that conversation to happen? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'll just give you, like, I'll just paint the picture, I guess, like, she was home from school. She's studying to be a neuroscientist. She's the smartest one of all my siblings. Um, she goes to school in the States, so we were just catching up. We were just catching up. And she supports me. She's a fan of my music, which is really dope. And she was just telling me that story. And just the way I operate now is like, um, again, even to circle back to that TED talk, I don't have to worry about getting clearance like that from my sisters, or at least it's way easier to get the clearance. So now if somebody around me is saying something that I think is captivating or I can use, I'm, all, I'm like always working. Like I, I, I turned, I, I told her like, wait a minute, just stop. I gotta turn the AC off. I can't hear you, which was a lie. I just wanted to get my voice memo on so I could record her like genuine story because then anybody knows they're being recorded, they speak a bit differently. Like when we, as soon as a camera comes out and somebody knows they're being filmed, immediately you see this person like start acting like a little different. It's like, so I just wanted to keep it as authentic as possible. And um, again, like I, I'm honestly just a big fan of the people in my life. Like, I know I'm the one in front of the camera and I'm the one making these songs, and but like, you know, these are the people that are inspiring these moments. Like, you know, my, like the mother of my child inspires so much of my music. You know, my friends inspire so much of my movement, you know, and, and those are the people that I have these discussions with. So why not empower them again? Why not? Like, it's my way of just paying homage to them. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so we're going to... We, we, we we're over time, so it's gonna get. Yeah, thank you. And they'll, they'll be around for questions after. Um, but the if we can just get into, we're gonna wrap up. Is there a closing thought, quick, from each of you guys? Um, a last word that you want to put in? Yeah, I want to know her question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Once you create Uh, for me, I ended up kind of assisting on a feature film and taking over all of their social media. So I was given a, a platform to kind of learn the ins and outs of, of social media. So once I kind of picked that up, because I hated social media prior to that, and now I love it, uh, I applied that to my web series. And I think it really comes down to connecting. You can't just copy and paste a message being like, yo, this is my new track, like you should blah, 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 blah. You have to connect with people. You have to spend the time being like, hey, how's your dog Molly? Like, I heard she was sick. Oh, by the way, I did this new track. Or, you know, connecting with uh, artists on, on Twitter. And I don't know, it's, you gotta learn your audience. Once you finish the product, then look at your product from like a different vantage point and think who would want to connect with this piece and then try to learn about those communities because most likely they're going to be your communities too. Yeah, I think put, putting in the energy to yeah. do that is huge, but it can like if you do it at that level where you literally just cut and paste and, and there's no relationship at all and no interaction outside of that, it's like it, it can feel like off-putting, right? Like it can have the opposite effect. 
It's trial and error too. Yeah. yeah. Just trial and error. I know Sean, you were talking about um like thinking a lot about marketing and and yeah, yeah, you know, because you, you have to think about that in promotion and, you know, you're trying to have a big impact and every, anytime you make anything, you want to have this massive impact and you want to, you know, you know, regardless if you admit it or not, you want to kind of trend, you know, but it's like there are entire groups of people that are making this stuff trend that's trending. So immediately you got to like set a realistic goal for yourself. And for me, whenever I do anything, I'm just trying to get one more person to fuck with me. You know, if I leave here tonight and just one more person does, then great. You know, all we can really do as artists is prepare ourselves for when that moment comes that we don't fumble it. You know, so nothing is a waste of time, even if it doesn't get the desired result. Anything I've ever done is done way worse than I thought I was going to do. Even like my best stuff, like it's done way lower than I thought I was going to do. And you just kind of like, you, you live with that and you move on. You know, me, it's like, I know how this game is and I know how independent I am. So that's why even my record is called Sean Lee on the Death of. Like, I saw the trend this year. I'm seeing how people don't get their flowers while they're around. I know how difficult it can be to do that and to give it to that person. So, you know, me, I, I own my masters. Everything I get is going to my daughter. So I know, God forbid, I die tomorrow. Sean Lee on the Death of is going to shoot up and they'll be good. You know, but in the meantime, it's like there's really not much I can I can do. I can have these conversations, you know, I could try and lock down a distributor, you know, but even just getting in those rooms is difficult. You know, it's like representation. Whenever people ask me, like, Sean, why aren't you where Kanye is or it's representation? You know, I can do what I, I can do very well, but I need a team. You need, you need a team, you need like support. You know, it's hard to just create this thing and it be this viral moment. Cause while you were typing up the caption, 30 things came out, you know what I mean? And I think that's the music saying, we I gotta shut up and we gotta go. So I'm gonna just end it on that. Yeah, well, it, and rude. it was a good question to end on. Oh, yeah, that was a great question. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just want to say, Mauricio, Sean, DW, thank you so much for being here, for giving so much you of your me. talent time. Thank you. Um, and, and to everybody who's here, like, again, your presence makes this so meaningful. Thank you to a free creator class at Launchpad Toronto. Check them out. And the MVP project people will be in the front by the free sign. Good night. <laughs>